and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the Heartland, I am delivering them to you from the Heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to Season 5, Episode 7 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Hey, Heartlanders, you guys patrons yet? Visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to join the club. You'll get ad-free versions of this and all our other podcasts, including hundreds of standalone releases from our audio archives dating back to 2012. It's a great way to show your support, and you get a whole lot for it. What did the chicken say to the Grim Reaper? Should have looked both ways. What's it called when the Grim Reaper screws up and gets a concussion? A repercussion? <laughs> what do Dwayne Johnson impersonators and Three Leaf Clovers have in common? They're both shamrocks? <laughs> Never iron a four-leaf clover. You don't want to press your luck. <clears throat> I probably already have. Two tales tonight by talented newcomer Bill Dorsch and a dear friend of Fear from the Heartland, Kendra Nicholson. Let's get after it. A distraught husband will do anything to save his dying wife, even bargain with death himself. However, he will discover that deals with death are anything but simple. A path of trials, enigmas, and moral dilemmas await him as he quests to save the love of his life. And now for your indulgence, The Requirements by Bill Dorsch. Jordan knelt beside the bed, keeping watch over his wife, Sarah, who continued to go increasingly still. The tears had long since dried up, but Jordan's eyes continued to flutter in a futile attempt to produce more of the salty brine. He had done everything that he had been able to do. All he could do now was wait. Three years ago, Jordan and Sarah had married. It was a brief courtship of mere months. An unexpected pregnancy hastened the decision but Jordan was not bothered by the circumstance. He had known from their first date that he wanted to marry this girl. He had been on his share of dates over his 26 years, but nobody had ever mesmerized him like she did. Sometimes, love at first sight is a real thing, and that was absolutely the case here. Jordan and Sarah's love continued to blossom even through the heartbreaking miscarriage that claimed their unborn child. They pressed on and built a life for themselves as best as any average 20-somethings could. They bought the house that would ultimately serve as Sarah's hospice in her waning days. Jordan had gotten himself into a good career. Sarah worked part-time in retail while continuing her studies. They had done everything they could to set themselves up for a wonderful life together, free of many of the worries and pressures that can ultimately overtake people. Unfortunately, even the best laid plans are not infallible. Sarah had become ill with meningitis. While most cases are mild and resolve themselves quickly, 
In Sarah's case, the disease took a strong, infective hold, never relaxing its grasp. At first, she had been able to function with the illness, but over the past six months, the prognosis had rapidly worsened. During a stretch in the hospital, sadly, Sarah entered a coma from which the doctor said she had little chance of awakening. After a few weeks, Jordan decided to make arrangements to bring Sarah home to be near and attend to her. He arranged for a hospital bed to be set up in the bedroom upstairs. In her comatose state, Sarah could no longer eat or drink, so Jordan had the nurses teach him how to administer her medication and nutritional injections. The doctor gave Jordan the instructions he would need to follow to allow Sarah the most comfort that he could provide. Now here he was at her side, awaiting the inevitable. Suffering from equal parts grief and fatigue, he almost didn't hear the footsteps approaching the bedroom from the hallway. Slowly but deliberately, the footsteps drew closer as Jordan's eyes peered up toward the bedroom door. The moment he had been dreading had finally arrived. The Grim Reaper, Death himself, entered the room and stood menacingly in front of the doorway. No, Jordan pleaded. No, please. Please, not her, please. I'm begging you, please don't take her from me. His voice's pitch increased with each plea like a child attempting to persuade a parent not to punish them. I am sorry, Jordan, Death replied in a deep, echoey voice. It is time. Please, surely we can figure something out, Jordan persisted. What about me? Yeah, take me instead. That is not possible, Jordan, Death responded. I am bound by my covenant. Your soul does not meet the requirements. Requirements? What do you mean? My soul isn't good enough? Jordan asked almost defiantly. It is not a question of being good enough. Each soul I am tasked with delivering must meet the requirements given to me when I am sent. Your soul does not meet the requirements I must fulfill. Death carried an empathetic tone despite the depth of his voice, as if he understood the heartbreak the young man was experiencing. Anything, please, I'll do anything, Jordan continued to plead. What if I find someone that meets the requirements that you could take instead? Would you let Sarah go then? Death paused a moment, then replied. My duties span beyond simply meeting the requirements. Time is also a factor. Though our realms experience time differently, it is not an infinite gift and must be respected. However, Jordan, you are a good man, so I will allow an opportunity to locate a suitable replacement soul. Hearing Death's words, Jordan's heart nearly jumped out of his chest. His eyes began to water again, this time a result of being overcome with hope. Thank you, thank you, thank you he exclaimed. So, what are the requirements this person has to meet? He asked. Unfortunately, Jordan, that is something I cannot share, as my covenant does not allow me to do so. Death replied, All I am able to do for you is confirm whether or not the soul you have chosen meets the requirements. I will ever figure out who is a match. Jordan thought. He didn't even know where to start, but at this point, trying anything was better than giving up entirely. You will be given a period of one month. During this time, Sarah will remain in her current state. No better, no worse. You will bring the soul that you wish to submit back to this house alive. Simply come back to this room and summon me. I will evaluate the soul to ensure it meets the requirements. If it does, I will confirm with you that you are ready to finalize the trade. If it does not, I will inform you as such, and you will be given another month to locate another replacement. Should you ever exceed a month before submitting another soul for evaluation, Sarah's soul must be claimed as originally intended. Death explained. These are the terms I am offering to you. 
do we have an accord? Death asked. Will she be okay again? I mean, she would go back to being healthy again, right? Jordan asked. Sarah will awaken and be healthy again. She will know of the arrangement we have made and all its details, and you must factor that into your decision. Death confirmed. Yes, yes, I agree. We have a deal. Jordan confirmed. He looked over to Sarah as if to promise her that he was going to save her no matter what he had to do. He squeezed her hand gently and turned to look up and thank his benefactor again, but death had already departed. The day following the agreement with death, Jordan found himself trying to figure out the requirements that would save Sarah and reunite them. Possibilities flooded his mind until he finally settled on what he thought made the most sense. She's very sick. Obviously, death is looking for someone suffering from the same illness as her since that is what was going to claim her life, Jordan reasoned. Upon deciding that this was the direction he was going, Jordan needed a plan of action. Asking somebody if they have meningitis is not exactly an ideal icebreaker. He needed a way to ensure the person had the disease without having to be quite so direct. It wasn't until about an hour later that Jordan remembered that Sarah's doctor had spoken with them about a support group for folks who had meningitis. At the time, Sarah was feeling good enough about her situation and did not have any real need to lean on a support group, so the suggestion was quickly filed away. At the time, she and Jordan joked about the prospect, believing they weren't the type of people to need to go whining and crying about the hand they had been dealt. The irony was not lost on Jordan, who was now feeling the type of distress that support groups try to help relieve. The very group they had blown off was now what he was relying on as his solution to this deadly puzzle. Later that week, Jordan appeared at the support group for the first time. Posing as a newly diagnosed patient, he played the part of a desperate and lost man to perfection. He had removed his wedding ring to subliminally add a layer of desperation, that of being alone while having to deal with this ailment. Of course, part of this desperation was no act, but in the context of needing help coping with an illness he didn't actually have, he came across as quite convincing. The others in the group expressed empathy and offered kind words in support of Jordan during the group-sharing portion of the meeting. Part of him felt guilty for leading them on, but he reasoned that he was doing this to save his wife and would under no other circumstances ever do something like this. It wasn't a perfect scapegoat, but he felt good enough about it to continue with the charade. When it came time to pair off for one-on-one -on -one discussions, he paired with an older man and sat down to talk. The man had been living with the disease for a long while, and though still having a relatively mild case, he had been stricken with his share of difficulties as a result. He then listened as Jordan introduced himself and gave a summary of his case. Having lived with and cared for a meningitis patient for many months now, he was able to weave a story that was quite believable. The old man absorbed the details and responded with warmth and encouragement for Jordan, again sending a slight wave of guilt through Jordan's body. Soon the meeting was coming to an end, and Jordan thanked everyone before heading back home. Over the next two weeks, Jordan would attend the support group on Tuesday and Thursday nights. He quickly endeared himself to the group with his willingness to share and his vulnerability. He wasn't entirely sure he had gained as much trust as he would have liked, but he understood that it was unlikely to have done so after only a couple of weeks. Knowing that his time was ticking away, he decided that it was time to make his move. At the conclusion of the next meeting, Jordan approached the old man. He explained that he was having a good bit of difficulty adjusting to everyday life. Jordan asked the old man if he would be willing to come to his house for coffee and allowed Jordan to pick his brain in hopes that it could make some facets of his daily life easier to endure. The old man happily agreed and reassured Jordan that he would help wherever he could. The man suggested the following afternoon to meet. Jordan thanked him, made his way toward the exit, and smiled to himself as he left the group meeting to head back home to Sarah with the good news. That night, Jordan pondered his decision. Am I really prepared to do this? Can I really sacrifice this old man? Okay, breathe. He's lived a very long life. He told me his wife has already passed. So I'm doing him a favor, right? I'm ending his illness and reuniting him with his love, and he's going to do the same for Sarah and me. Yeah. 
This is going to be fine. The next afternoon, there was a knock at the door and Jordan sprang up from the couch to answer it. The old man was greeted, invited inside, and offered a seat. Jordan retreated to the kitchen to serve coffee and offered some biscotti alongside the beverages. The old man gladly accepted and began to enjoy the fare. Jordan chatted with the man for about an hour, a courtesy extended in return for the gift the old man was, unknowingly, about to bestow upon him and Sarah. He was not so cold as to immediately run and tell death to cut this man's life short. He would, at the very least, indulge the man in one last conversation. Once the conversation reached a natural pause, Jordan excused himself for a moment, promising to return shortly. He climbed the stairs, walked into the bedroom, held his wife's hand in his own, and prepared to complete the agreement made those few weeks ago. Death, Jordan whispered, not wanting to take a chance on the old man hearing him. I'm here. I have what you asked for. He's waiting in the living room downstairs. A moment passed and then Jordan began to hear the slow, deliberate footsteps coming down the hallway. At first he feared it was, perhaps the old man, coming to see what was keeping him. However, Jordan's momentary worry was assuaged when death appeared in the room, standing in front of the doorway, just as he had the few weeks prior. Death, thank you so much for coming back, Jordan whispered. You no longer need to whisper, Jordan. Your visitor will not be able to hear us when I am present, Death explained. So, can we complete our deal now? Jordan asked, returning to a normal volume. I'm sorry, Jordan, Death replied, but the soul you have offered to me does not meet the requirements. The words made Jordan's knees buckle. He had been so sure that he had figured it out but death's denial of the old man cut him like a knife. That can't be, Jordan exclaimed. He's sick, just like Sarah. That has to be what you're looking for. I'm sorry, Jordan, death reiterated, but the soul does not meet the requirements. As per our accord, you will have a month from today to bring another soul for evaluation or I will have to deliver Sarah's soul as originally intended. Death then left the room, leaving Jordan in disbelief and shock. Defeated, Jordan returned to the living room, explained to the old man that he wasn't feeling well and would have to retire for the day, then bid him goodbye. No sooner did the door close than Jordan began to feel the tears stream down his cheeks as he crumpled to the floor. What else could it be? Jordan tortured himself, trying to figure out where he had gone wrong. He understood that the possibilities were infinite, but kept trying to come up with something logical. Surely it wouldn't be something so silly as her hair color or anything like that. Death wouldn't be that simple. He'd never have agreed to this if it was that easy. But he also wouldn't have agreed to it if it was something he knew I would never be able to figure out. As Jordan was preparing dinner the next day, a theory suddenly came to him. Maybe I was right the first time, but only half right. Maybe death looking for someone with Sarah's illness, a woman with her illness. It was, Jordan could admit to himself, simply a theory, but he was confident that it was worth pursuing. He was too late to attend the group meeting that night, but made plans to attend the following week. Jordan walked into the group meeting feeling as nervous as he had felt on the first day. He shyly bid the old man hello, feeling somewhat awkward having to face the person that he had essentially marked for death not a few days prior, though he realized the old man didn't know it. He went through the paces of the meeting, almost in a state of autopilot. When the meeting concluded, he approached a woman who he had seen almost every meeting he had attended so far. He set up the same arrangement to meet that he had made with the old man the week before, this time under the guise of his new girlfriend having a hard time coming to terms with his disease. He asked the woman if she'd come over to the house to give a woman's perspective on how to deal with the disease in hopes that it would help the relationship. The next day came and much like the last time, Jordan leapt to answer the door when it signaled his guest's arrival. He showed the woman in and guided her to the living room. Coffee and refreshments were offered 
and Jordan engaged in small talk with the woman for several minutes. He was not as interested this time in spending a lot of needless time chatting and, as such, excused himself more quickly than he had with the old man. He ascended the stairs and approached the bedroom. Death, he whispered, again being mindful of not being audible to his guest. I brought you what you wanted this time. Are you there? After a brief moment, the now familiar footsteps approached the bedroom. Death entered the room and stood in his usual place. So are we good this time? This one has to be it, right? Jordan asked. I'm sorry, Jordan, Death replied, but the soul you have offered to me does not meet the requirements. Jordan's face began to turn red upon hearing the words, Come on, are you kidding me? What else could you possibly want? He exclaimed angrily. I am sorry, but I cannot accept this soul. As per our accord, you will have a month from today to bring another soul for evaluation, or I will have to deliver Sarah's soul as originally intended. Death left the room, leaving a stunned and frustrated Jordan to process his next steps. Jordan quickly went downstairs and apologized to the woman, explaining that he had taken ill and that they would have to reschedule. He saw her out, thanking her for her time, and slid down against the closed front door to sit and think. The next few months were filled with attempt after attempt by Jordan to satiate death's mysterious requirements, all to no avail. He tried simple matches, hair color, eye color, hair and eye color, even another woman named Sarah. He even found another person from Sarah's hometown, yet nothing could satisfy the stringent parameters of his objective. Jordan slowly but surely became mentally fatigued with the constant struggle and found himself spiraling deeper into depression. With each rejection by death, he became further convinced that he was never going to find the answer he was looking for. He would often break down, becoming inconsolable for hours at a time. Not that there was anyone to console him. They didn't make support groups for this situation. As time passed, Jordan found himself going to the local bar at night after tending to Sarah's injections and ensuring she was all set for the evening. He never drank to a dangerous level while he was there. He still had responsibilities and couldn't afford any screw-ups. He did, however, attempt to numb the pain, even if only slightly. It was at this bar that he first met Susan. He had been sitting at the bar, lost in his usual fog of whiskey and meditation, looking up at the lone TV in the corner, but not really absorbing what was shown on the screen. I've never seen somebody so entranced by an infomercial before, Susan said, slightly giggling after her observation. Jordan did a slight head shake, as one might do, and tapped on the shoulder after nodding off. Huh? Oh, that. Sorry, I was somewhere else entirely. Did you say something? Jordan asked. Just curious what was so interesting about a collapsible yard shovel that it would make you look like a deer in headlights, Susan said with a smile. May I join you? Maybe I'll end up calling in and ordering one. Jordan let out a small chuckle and patted the bar stool next to him to indicate that she was welcome to sit. He hadn't really looked closely at first, but when she sat down, Jordan was immediately drawn to her. She wasn't dressed for a night at the club, but she had taken effort with her hair and makeup, and, paired with her not-quite-designer top and jeans, she had a certain radiance about her that got Jordan's full attention. She came across, at first glance, as elegant, but not high-maintenance. She had already made him laugh, and her smile was downright infectious. Even the tone of her voice was perfect, soothing. Jordan smiled back at Susan and offered her a drink. No, no, first round is on me. Susan insisted. Jordan tried to throw out his best poker face, but still flashed a look of surprise at her. This was the first time he had ever been offered the first round by a woman. Even Sarah hadn't made such an offer when they had first met. Um, okay. Thanks very much. I'll get the next one, Jordan replied. The two talked all night until last call. They mostly engaged in small talk and people watched, occasionally commenting about something random that flashed on the TV and frequently bursting into small fits of laughter together. Jordan had not felt this joyous in months, 
even a year or more. He had been having such a good time that he didn't even mention having a wife. It wasn't that he was trying to be deceitful. The conversational topics just never got to that depth. He had never bothered to put his wedding ring back on after starting to attend the group, and the folks he had brought to the house never pointed out his lack of a ring, so it never crossed his mind to put it back on. Jordan bid Susan a good evening, expressing his hope to see her again for another round of laughs and drinks, then returned home to his cold reality. Over the course of the next few weeks, Jordan continued to visit the bar, oftentimes seeing Susan there and talking with her. They were beginning to form a real connection and started making plans to have bar night at least once a week. Jordan realized that, while nothing untoward was going on, telling Susan he was married was probably not a wise idea, should he want to be able to continue to enjoy his time out with her each week. He felt somewhat guilty for the misrepresentation, but reasoned that he should be able to be selfish in this one instance. He had spent more than a year doing nothing for himself, so he was going to let himself have this one. Despite his newfound nightlife, Jordan had not forgotten his mission. He continued to bring people to the house under various pretenses, hoping that some minute detail that he had pieced together would finally be the one that Death was looking for. Continuously, his submissions were denied, and it almost became a foregone conclusion to Jordan that whomever he brought on each attempt was certain to be walking back out the front door, soul intact. Eventually, he began to resign himself to the fact that he would never find the right soul to make the trade. The exercise turned into one of futility, devoid of emotion, and performed simply because he had promised to do so. Susan continued to be the one spark of life that Jordan had left. Over the course of the previous few months, he had grown a deep attraction to her. He had never acted on any of his urges, but his heart jumped to life and his body felt a little lighter whenever she was around. One evening, a few hours into drinks, Susan looked over to Jordan with a gaze that was more serious than usual. Jordan, can I ask you something? She asked. Of course, what's up? Jordan replied. I've had a really great time getting to know you, coming here, having laughs and drinks. But I need to ask you something, and I'm afraid that it's going to screw this all up, she said, looking slightly downward. Just ask. It's fine, I promise, Jordan assured her. After a bit of hesitation, Susan continued. Look, I think you're great. I really like you and spending time with you. I wanted to know if tonight, instead of just calling it a night after last call, maybe we could, I don't know, head back to my place and hang out or something? Before Jordan could answer, Susan immediately followed up her inquiry. You know what? No, sorry. Forget I said anything. That was a stupid thing to ask. Hey, come on now. It's okay, really, Jordan said, making sure his tone was comforting. He put his arm around her and squeezed her shoulder assuringly and continued. We can hang out, sure. I'm off tomorrow and I'd love to see how a great girl like you lives outside of going to somewhat questionable bars. After a smile and another drink, the two departed. As Jordan followed Susan back to her home, he started to think about what he was doing. Is this a sign? Is this death telling me there is no match for these stupid requirements? and I need to let Sarah go and live my life? Susan has been such a great person to be around and I am thinking I am starting to love her. Is that right? Considering Sarah is still alive? I've been holding on to Sarah for so long, but everything I try in order to save her comes up short. I can't live like this forever. It's not fair to Sarah to leave her in this state indefinitely, if in fact there is no way out. It's not fair to myself to live in this infinitely revolving pattern with no hope for the future. Susan's home was small but well kept. It was a single story, no basement, two bedrooms, one bathroom, and was nicely decorated. It had a small living room with a TV and couch along with a mock fireplace. It was in this room where the two sat after their arrival. Susan offered Jordan something to drink, which he accepted. She returned with a bottle of Cabernet, which Jordan uncorked upon its delivery. He poured the glasses while she turned on some music at low volume. They toasted each other, then talked while enjoying the remainder of the bottle, which did not take more than half an hour. Susan finished the last sip of her glass and looked across at Jordan. She stood up and motioned for him to come over to her. Jordan realized what was happening. 
In fact, he knew it before he had even gotten out of the car. But he had decided that he was going to do this for himself. He knew deep down that he was never going to save Sarah, no matter how hard he tried. So the best he could do was look ahead. And ahead was a wonderful woman who actually enjoyed being around him and really seemed to care about him. Ahead was a woman that he had fallen for, a woman he realized that he loved. As conflicted as he felt, he rationalized that Sarah would want him to be happy after she had passed. In her state, it was as if she had been gone for months now anyway, and it was hardly fair for it to be considered cheating if there wasn't anyone for me to cheat on. Jordan reasoned. Jordan accepted Susan's call to join her and the two danced to the slow, quiet music. Quickly, the two shifted from dancing to kissing, and slowly they made their way into Susan's bedroom, both fostering a nervous excitement for what was about to follow. After they had settled down for the night and began to drift off to sleep, Jordan spent his last few waking moments thinking about what had just happened and what he was going to do going forward. It was quickly coming up on the deadline set by death. Jordan had all but resigned himself to letting the time pass, letting Sarah go quietly and settling into his new life with Susan. As he sat on his couch, half-heartedly watching his television, he wondered what his family would think about his moving on so quickly, but he really didn't care too much. He was going to be happy, and they could either be on board with that or not. He was in love. He was in love in a way that he hadn't been since the day he had met Sarah. That's it, Jordan thought, gasping to himself. That's really it. Death wants someone I'm in love with. It can't just be a random person from wherever. It has to be a true sacrifice, someone that means something to me. It all makes sense now. But now what? I did all this to get Sarah back. And now I can. I did pledge to save her. But it would cost me Susan, who has made me feel more alive than I have in so long. Susan deserves to live a long, happy life. Of course, that being true for other people didn't stop me from offering up their souls, and I've only known Susan a short time. But I love her as much as I loved Sarah when we first met. I can't be with both Sarah and Susan at once. I have to choose. This is what death wants. Jordan's internal struggle raged on for hours. He had two days left before the deadline of his agreement with death. He had to decide to either complete the mission he had been on or give Sarah up for good and begin a new life with Susan. After a few more hours, he finally decided what he was going to do. His hand visibly shook from tension as he began to dial the phone. Susan arrived at the house the next evening. Jordan was still trembling as he walked what seemed like a mile to the door to answer it. He had spent the day straightening up and removing any pictures, keepsakes, and other items that hinted at Sarah's presence in the house. He had always planned to have that discussion after Sarah had passed and didn't want to risk Susan discovering anything prematurely. She might get angry and leave before he could get to the bedroom and summon death, and then he'd have lost both her and Sarah. Even thinking about that scenario was enough to turn his stomach and weaken his knees. He welcomed Susan into the house and gave her a small kiss before leading her to the living room. He offered her a seat and a drink, which she gladly accepted. Normally, Jordan would have sat down and had a conversation for a bit. In this case, however, he was so filled with anxiety that he realized as hard as it was, that the best approach was to get the task over with as quickly as possible. He figured that if he tried to hold a conversation, that Susan would easily catch on to his unease or, even worse, try to curl up next to him. Neither of those scenarios boded well for going through with everything. Jordan excused himself, explaining that he was going to use the bathroom. He climbed the stairs and walked hurriedly to the bedroom. He took a moment as he knelt down next to the bed where Sarah lay and tried to quell his trembling before he spoke. Death, he whispered, his voice quivering. I'm here. Jordan's eyes began to well up as he heard the familiar footsteps approaching the bedroom. He fought back the urge to get sick as the dark figure appeared in the room. I brought what you wanted, Jordan said, his voice trembling with each word. Death stood still for a moment, then began to speak. You have indeed provided a soul 
that sufficiently meets the requirements I seek. I must ask you, Jordan, are you prepared to finalize the agreement? There can be no reversal of this decision once it is made. Jordan felt a tear running down his cheek as he replied, I'm ready. He looked down at the floor, partly in shame, partly from fatigue. When Jordan looked up, he was startled to see death standing over him. It's time, Jordan, Death said to him, holding out a hand as a parent would to a small child. Jordan looked up, confused. What do you mean? I thought my part was done. Death calmly replied, It has been done. You have chosen to sacrifice your own soul for that of Sarah's, and now it is time to depart. The words hit Jordan as hard as a sledgehammer. He felt all of the blood in his body rush to his feet and a wave of sheer terror overtook him. No, not me. No, that's not what I meant. Jordan cried out. I'm sorry, Jordan. The agreement has been reached and it is time to depart, Death explained. But wait, I was here every single time. You even told me on the first night that I didn't fit. Why after months and months of this... Am I all of a sudden good enough? Jordan demanded to know. Death patiently replied, Because the agreement has been settled and it is your own soul that will be delivered, I am able to tell you. The soul that I am to deliver is that of an unfaithful partner. Jordan's body went numb. His face contorted into a look of despair and disbelief. After a moment to process the information, he could only muster a timid, What? What Jordan didn't know was that the miscarriage that Sarah had gone through wasn't a miscarriage at all. She had engaged in a brief affair with one of her co-workers and, after finding out she was pregnant, was too afraid to risk having the child. She had feared that, if it was the co-worker who was the father, it would be obvious after the birth and Jordan would know what she had done. While she had been having second thoughts about her rush to marriage, she didn't want to find herself alone caring for a child. Her co-worker certainly wouldn't support them, and Jordan would certainly refuse to do so if the child was not his. She had decided to terminate the pregnancy. What Sarah had not known was that her co-worker lover was also a carrier of meningitis, kissing being a common method of transmission. Sarah had contracted the disease not long after the affair had begun. The co-worker had remained symptom-free, but Sarah had, of course, not been so lucky. Jordan was nearly catatonic. Heartbroken, he took Death's hand into his own. He felt Death gently pull in an effort to help him to his feet. Death motioned with his arm toward the end of the room where a mystical-looking doorway had appeared. Jordan walked toward it, turning his head back briefly to look at his body, sitting but slumped over against the wall next to the bed. He hung his head as he walked through the doorway and into the unknown. Sarah stirred and for the first time in months sat up. She stood, shaking her extremities to ensure there was feeling in them and stretched out her arms. She looked over at Jordan's lifeless body. A sly smile crossed her face, knowing what had brought them all to this moment. She knew she would have to get rid of Susan, but that wouldn't be too difficult. Surely, finding out Jordan had been hiding a wife from her this whole time would do the trick. After that, a quick call to emergency services to report Jordan's heart attack would be the last loose end to tie before being a free woman once again. A free woman who is about to be the benefactor of a respectable life insurance windfall. She exited the bedroom and descended the stairs to begin the new life Jordan had given her, just as he had promised. Hope you enjoyed tonight's tale, The Requirements, by Bill Dorsch. Bill Dorsch is an avid horror fan from the northwest corner of Indiana. When not consuming horror in text, film, or game, he enjoys playing music, board gaming, and poker. 
He can often be found driving the country roads of Indiana late at night, enjoying many a dark audio tale while savoring a good cigar. When Liam tries to impress his girlfriend Maggie with a romantic gesture, it backfires. What lengths will an ordinary guy in extraordinary circumstances go to in the hope that he can have just one more lucky day? And now for your indulgence, Lucky Day by Kendra Nicholson. One. Okay, Liam said as he pulled into the gravel parking area. We're here. Let's go find that four-leaf clover. Maggie laughed and shook her head. I told you I've never found one. Ever. In my 32 years of life, I've never found one. And believe you me, I have looked. I stopped trying years ago. What if I told you that this time was going to be different? I just have a feeling that today is your lucky day, he said, opening her door and holding out his hand to her. She took his hand and stepped out of the car, and they began walking down the hiking trail until they came to a meadow where he led her over to the far edge near the woods. She looked down and saw a circle two feet wide that had been completely cleared, except for one perfect four-leaf clover right in the center. Liam, she whispered. Did you... Yeah, I did. I can't believe this, she said as she stared at the ground. It must have taken you forever to find it and then clear all the clover and grass around it. This is the sweetest thing that anyone I've dated has ever done for me. Then she hugged him close and gave him a kiss. She pulled back, bent down, and plucked the clover. They strolled back to the car hand in hand. As they were driving to her house, she exclaimed, Wait! Stop! Stop right here at that 7-Eleven! He pulled over, parked, and followed her inside. I've never bought a lottery ticket before, she said to the cashier. How does it work? Liam laughed as the cashier explained the difference between a lottery ticket and a scratch ticket. She didn't want to pick numbers and wait for the regular lottery, so she bought a scratcher and pulled a coin out of the take-a-penny tray by the register. You think I'm being ridiculous, don't you? She asked as she started scraping the card with the dime. Yes, I do, Liam responded, and she playfully elbowed him and began laughing too, but suddenly she stopped. Liam, I think I won. Okay, now you're just messing with me. No, I'm serious, look. And she held up the ticket. He was stunned. Holy shit, Maggie, you just won $500. What do I do? The cashier heard them and asked, 500? They both nodded in excitement. He said, If it's under 600, you can just cash it here. When they got back in the car, she fanned the five $100 bills out in her hand and said, I should have gotten this in small bills so I could spread them out on the bed and roll around in them. They were still laughing when they arrived at her house and she invited him in. They walked around to the back door and she scooped up a large Amazon box and asked Liam to put in the code for her lock. He entered the four-digit code she rattled off, and they went inside. She walked over to the bookcase and pulled out a scrapbook, opened it, and gently laid the clover inside to press it. Then she turned to him, took his hands in hers, and said, Now, let's celebrate, getting up on her tiptoes to give him a deep kiss. Oh, yeah? He murmured dropping her hands and wrapping his arms around her waist. What do you have in mind? As he leaned in to kiss her again, her phone rang. Damn it, she said, picking it up to look at it. It's my boss. I gotta take this. Liam left her to her call and went to the kitchen to grab a beer out of the fridge. When he came out, she was gathering her things to leave. I gotta run, she said excitedly. I got the contract for the interior design of the Meisner home. Can you believe it? I mean... Seriously, I had given up on hearing anything back from them, she said as she rushed past him. Can you lock up? Sure, no problem. Congratulations. I know it's probably just a crazy coincidence, but I feel like you really did give me your luck today. Then she rushed out the door 
and he sat down to finish his beer. 2. Liam awoke startled, realizing that there was too much light in the room for it to be his normal 6.30 a.m. wake up. He picked his phone up off the nightstand and saw that his alarm hadn't gone off and it was nearly 7.30. He scrambled out of bed, brushed his teeth and wet his hair to tame his bedhead, then rushed to the closet to put on his dress pants and a wrinkled button down that he had no time to iron, grabbed a pair of socks out of the drawer and ran down the hall barefoot picking up his shoes that were laying in the entryway. He snagged his keys off of the hook and headed out the front door. He was scheduled to meet a client at the office at 8 o'clock to show a home and he was cutting it close. He pulled out of the driveway and began trying to put on his socks one-handed, phone in the other hand to send a text to his co-worker Walter to let him know he was on his way, all while he steered with his knee. God, he needed a cup of coffee and now he was going to have to drink the swill in the break room. He was completely distracted and lost in thought when he heard the whoop of a siren behind him. Are you kidding me? He wailed out loud as he pulled over. The officer walked up to his vehicle and said, Morning, I'm Officer Davis. License and registration, please. Yeah, of course, he said as he reached into his pocket, realizing that in his rush, he had forgotten his wallet. He felt his face get hot and he started talking quickly. Oh man, I was running late this morning. I have an important client that I'm meeting and for some reason my alarm didn't go off. I didn't even have time to put my shoes on or make coffee. I live about a half a block away and I can just run back there and get it. No license, huh? You know that I can give you a ticket just for that. It is illegal to operate a motor vehicle in the state of Missouri without a valid driver's license. Yes, yeah, sir, I'm aware, and I am a licensed driver. I j just, like I said, I just, I was running late and... The officer interrupted. Right, running late, important business, no shoes, got it. Do you have your vehicle registration and proof of insurance in the car? Liam felt instant relief. Yes, yes I do, it's right here. He opened the glove box, found the documents, and handed them to the officer who walked back to his car. Liam looked at his dash clock. 7.45. There was no way he could make it to work in time for his meeting. He had put in a tremendous amount of time finding just the right property for this client, and the commission would be substantial. Damn it! He yelled, punching the steering wheel. Much to his horror, the horn sounded. He looked in his rearview mirror and could see that Officer Davis had been startled and now looked absolutely furious. He exited his car and approached Liam's window with his hand resting on the gun on his hip. I'm sorry, officer, I'm so sorry, he said holding his hands up. I had a moment of frustration and I punched the steering wheel and accidentally blew the horn. Sounds like you have some anger management issues, Mr. Hughes. No, sir, I actually don't, I just, I mean, I know that it looks like that right now, but the officer interrupted. I pulled you over to let you know that you've got a busted taillight. As a courtesy, I had no plan to give you a ticket. I'm not feeling as generous as I was then, though. Now I'm going to walk back to my car and write that ticket for the taillight and another for driving without a valid license. Liam sat with his arms folded on the steering wheel, his forehead resting on them until the officer came back and gave him the tickets leaned down with his hands on the windowsill and said, You're lucky I'm not taking you into the station for harassment. Yeah, lucky, he mumbled. Excuse me? Nothing. Buddy, you are walking on thin ice right now. He nodded his head, too afraid to say anything. By the time he arrived at work, Walter had already left to show the client the house, so Liam got back in his car and sped over. As he walked up to the door, Walter and the client, his client, were smiling and shaking hands. He had lost the deal. Had he really given his luck away to Maggie? Is that what was going on? No, no way. He was being ridiculous. 3. Liam walked into his grandfather's house and instantly felt better. Grandpa, I'm here, 
he announced and walked into the living room to see his favorite person in the world sitting in his recliner. How you doing, Grandpa? I'm old. How do you think I'm doing? Grandpa's eyes lit up as he laughed. It's always so good to see you, son. Liam smiled and said, It's always good to see you, too. He was closer to his grandfather than he was to anyone. His parents divorced when he was in third grade, and they had each been more interested in living their own lives than they were in being parents, so he had basically grown up in this house. What's wrong, son? Liam smiled and shook his head. Is it that obvious? His grandpa answered, I'm going to go put on the kettle, then I'll be back, and I want you to tell me everything. He came back with Liam's favorite mint tea with just the right amount of honey, and he told his grandfather everything that had happened, adding, I'm probably just overreacting, but I have a weird feeling about the whole thing now. Mm-hmm. Grandpa nodded his head in understanding. You gave up your luck to get lucky. Yeah, I guess I did, he laughed. But that didn't even work. She got a call from her boss and had to leave. Grandpa gave another nod, opened the drawer in the side table by his chair and pulled out his pipe. He had stopped smoking several years ago, but when he was thinking about something important, he would often go through the motions of smoking it. He would hold the bowl in his palm and push his thumb down like he was tamping down the tobacco, then he would put the stem between his teeth. He could still smell a hint of the cherry vanilla tobacco that was his favorite. How well do you know this young lady? We've been dating for about a month and I haven't been seeing anyone else. I really like her a lot. Grandpa nodded his head again. Well, son, you think you could ask her to give it back to you? Liam was surprised at his response. Grandpa wasn't a particularly superstitious man, so he expected him to say that it was all a coincidence and not to worry about it. He answered, I don't know. I would feel weird doing that. It would be pretty embarrassing, you know? I understand that. Here's the thing, though. It may very well be coincidental. But then again, it's my understanding that the leaves on a regular clover represent hope, faith, and love. On a four-leaf clover, the fourth leaf represents good luck. As you know, there aren't many of those. Fate gives them to you, and if you spite fate by giving them away, it will turn against you. What if I find another one? He asked hopefully. Well, I suppose you could try, but fate might not smile on you again. 4. Liam sat in his car in the same spot he parked in when he gave the clover to Maggie and stared at his phone. He had snapchatted her hours ago, and she had yet to respond. He shoved it into his pocket, got out, and jogged over to the clover patch. He had always had a weird ability to find four-leaf clovers. For some reason, the break in the three-leaf pattern would pop out at him without having to try too hard to find them. The area around the circle he had cleared was still thick with clover, and he bent over and slowly began running his eyes over the patch. Half an hour later, he was down on his hands and knees running his fingers through them a second time, feeling oddly panicked. His grandfather's words played on repeat in his head. If you spite fate by giving them away, it will turn against you. He walked further down the trail and saw another meadow, so he crossed over and found a small patch. He went back down on all fours, and when he reached in to run his fingers through it, he felt a sharp pain in the palm of his hand and knew he had been stung by a bee. Liam had a severe allergy and his EpiPen was in the car. It was at least a 15-minute hike back to the parking lot, so he knew he needed to haul ass. He tried to pull out the stinger as he jogged, but his hands were shaky and the sting area was already beginning to throb and puff up. He had struggled with it for longer than the few seconds it took for the histamine and the bee's venom to get into his system. About five minutes into the jog, his throat and mouth began to feel itchy, and there were red patches going up his forearm. He worried that raising his heart rate by jogging might be speeding up the symptoms, so he slowed to a walk and focused on his breathing. By the time he got to his car, he could feel his lips and tongue starting to swell, and he had begun wheezing. He unlocked the door with his key fob and clumsily pulled it open. 
He collapsed into the driver's seat and dug his EpiPen out of the center console, pulling the cap off with his teeth. He plunged the needle through his jeans into his thigh and pressed the injector. He felt an almost immediate head rush with a jump in his heart rate. Then the symptoms began to subside and he could breathe again. He knew he should go straight to the emergency room to get checked out, but instead he drove over to Maggie's house. As he pulled up about half a block away, he saw her standing on the sidewalk in front of her house in an embrace with another man. You gotta be fitting me, Liam mumbled, lips and tongue still slightly swollen. He started to get out of the car, then he dropped his hands into his lap and said, This sucks. I can't go over there like this. Excuse me, but could you please stop playing suck faith with my girlfriend before I kick your ass? Then he started laughing. He was just chuckling at first, but it led into a deep, uncontrollable, eye-watering laughter that made his stomach hurt. It felt amazing. Cathartic. He could think a little more clearly now. She still hadn't noticed him there, so he parked and watched and waited. After what felt like an hour of watching them play front yard grab ass, they finally got in Maggie's car and drove away. Liam pulled around the block and parked in the alley behind her house. He walked up to the door and entered the code she had given him the night before. Bingo. He was in. He walked directly to the bookshelf and found the scrapbook. As he flipped through it looking for the clover, he saw a photo of the guy in the yard with letter stickers that said, Riley, with hearts on either side. I guess her luck was that she was back with her ex. Athholes, he said to himself as he pocketed the clover and walked out the door. 5. Liam awoke to his phone alarm going off. When he picked it up to silence it, he saw that he had missed a call from his mom. Weird. She never called him. His stomach sank as he listened to his voicemail. Liam, you need to come to Mercy Hospital as quickly as possible. Your grandpa took a pretty bad fall getting out of the shower and hit the back of his head on the corner of the countertop. He's in the ICU... Her voice broke. Please hurry. For the second day in a row, he grabbed his shoes, bolted out of the house, and jumped in his car, but today he was still in his pajamas and his hair was sticking up in every direction. His mom was standing in the hallway talking to the doctor when Liam arrived. He was nearly out of breath when he hugged her and asked, How is he? The doctor answered, There was some bleeding in his brain, but we think it has stopped. Unfortunately, there is still some swelling, so we won't know how much damage it has done until that starts to go down, and that could be a few hours, but more than likely it will be a few days. He is not responding to any stimuli at all yet. It's odd, really. He didn't actually strike his head very hard. He just hit it in the wrong place. Bad luck, really. Bad luck. There it was again. This was his fault. Can I see him? The doctor nodded and Liam walked into the room. If it weren't for all the tubes and equipment, his grandfather would have looked like he was sleeping. Grandpa, it's me, he said as tears streamed down his face. I'm so sorry. I got the clover back, but I don't know. I just, I don't understand why it's not working. I got it back. He stopped. He realized what he did wrong. She didn't give it to him. He took it. I've got to go, Grandpa. I have to go make this right. 6. Liam knocked on Maggie's back door. After a few moments, she yelled, Who is it? It's me, Maggie. I need to talk to you. She opened the door and said, I have been needing to talk to you, too. Then she saw the state he was in. Liam, oh my God, what's going on? Are you okay? No, no, I'm not okay. She nervously answered, I'm sorry that I haven't returned your texts. I just, I have started seeing Riley again and... I know, he said flatly. How, how do you know? She said, pulling the neck of her robe tighter. I saw you in the yard as I drove by. Does he know about me? No, he does not, she said. 
No one knows about you, Liam. I didn't tell anyone. Why do you think I always use Snapchat with you? I didn't want Riley to see my phone and find our messages. Look, I had fun with you, but what we had was just a fling, okay? Liam felt his face flush. He was mortified. He knew that he had probably fallen for her too quickly, but to hear that she didn't feel anything at all for him was a shock. It hurt. He was embarrassed. Angry. He wanted to turn and run away, but he was desperate to help his grandfather. He bent forward with his hands on his knees and his head down for a couple of moments trying just to breathe and clear his head. Liam? Maggie said tentatively. Just give me a second, he responded. Are you okay? He shook his head and looked back up at her, feeling nothing but rage. Am I okay? He laughed. Am I okay? The laughter stopped. No, I am not okay. She took a step backward. I'm, I'm sorry. Shut up, he said coldly. I need you to give me the four-leaf clover. What? You heard me. Give it to me. What the? She started to say and he interrupted with, No, give it to me now. She gasped in fright and stumbled backward, then turned and went toward the bookshelf. Okay, okay, just calm down, okay? No, not like that. I have it, he said, and he pulled it out of his pocket in a little baggie. You, you have it? She asked in horror. How, how did you? I took it. You gave me the code to your door and I came in and took it when you went out with Riley. Get out! Get out of my house right now! I'm going to call the police! She screamed. She pulled out her phone and began to unlock the screen when Liam stepped forward and knocked it out of her hand, sending it clattering across the floor. Maggie turned to run and Liam grabbed her by the arm and spun her around, clamping his hand around her throat. He pushed her back against the wall and held her there. She wrapped her hands around his wrist and pulled, trying to pry it off her neck as he yelled, Take it! You have to take it and then give it back to me! Take it! Eyes wide with panic, she grabbed the baggie and clutched it. He held out his open hands and said, Now give it to me! Drop it! Give me the clover! But she was stiff and clenched with terror. Give it to me! He screamed. He squeezed harder as her mouth gaped open and finally her hand went limp and the baggie with the clover fell into his hand. He let go of her and she slumped to the floor. He turned away from her and pocketed his precious luck. I'm sorry it had to come to this, Maggie. If you had just handed it to me, I could have just walked out the door. She didn't respond. He turned back to her and she was lying with her eyes open and mouth agape, tongue protruding. Maggie? He said in shock. Mags? He walked to her and knelt down, feeling her bruised neck for a pulse, but there was none. A shot of adrenaline coursed through his body, and he was left with a moment of pure clarity as he remembered her words. No one knows about you, Liam. I didn't tell anyone. He left through the back door. 7. Liam slept fitfully in the ICU waiting room. He woke in the morning and wandered down to the bathroom where he washed his face and rinsed his mouth before heading to the cafeteria for some coffee. He sat at a table and pulled out his phone to check the news. It was the top story. Springfield police have announced that the death of a woman yesterday evening was a case of murder and they have made an arrest. Police say Riley McAllister, 34, is being charged with the murder of Maggie Sloan. Sloan, 32, was found dead in her home. A neighbor who has chosen to remain anonymous told a reporter that she heard a struggle and called the police who arrived 20 minutes later to find the suspect, McAllister, fleeing the home. Liam read the article again. They arrested Riley. He must have shown up after Liam left, then panicked and tried to run away when he heard the police arrive. Liam thought perhaps he should feel guilty or even relieved, but he felt nothing. He was numb. What happened with Maggie seemed like a nightmare today. It didn't feel real. He saw that it was now visiting hours, so he got up and went back to the ICU. When he approached the bed, his grandfather looked like he had the night before, but when Liam took his hand and said, Grandpa, 
I'm here. He felt a squeeze. Grandpa, can you open your eyes for me? He stood in amazement as his grandfather's eyelids fluttered, then opened. He was awake. Hey, how are you doing? Liam choked out through the lump in his throat. His grandfather moved his mouth, looking like he was trying to talk, and Liam leaned in close as he said in a breathy whisper, I'm old. How do you think I'm doing? Liam laughed and pushed the nurse's call button and she came right away. He's awake. Look, his eyes are open. Liam said, crying with relief. She patted him on the shoulder. Perfect timing. Dr. DeMorlis is making his rounds. I'll let him know. The doctor came in and did a quick neurological check and said, I didn't think he would improve this quickly. If I'm being completely honest, I didn't think he would improve at all. I'm certainly pleased. Looks like today is your lucky day. Liam smiled. He felt lucky. Fate was smiling on him again. I hope you enjoyed tonight's story, Lucky Day, by Kendra Nicholson. Kendra Nicholson was born and raised in Missouri. She was a stay-at-home mom to two boys for over a decade, then used her degree in theater with a minor in English to perform and teach comedy improv and sketch in the Los Angeles area. She and her husband lost their youngest son to suicide in 2018 and realized what a lack of reading material there is out there for teens who have lost a loved one due to suicide so she decided to do something about it. She published her first novel in 2020 on what would have been her son's birthday. It is available on Amazon, and it's called The Climb. It is written from the perspective of a 13-year-old boy who loses his big brother to suicide as he works through his grief. She and her husband have recently moved back to Missouri, and they are happy to be back in the heartland. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S.net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens. So if you haven't subscribed yet, I'd really appreciate it. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland.